Ash Princess, Chapter Eleven, Kazarin. It's barely noon when the sharp official knock sounds at the door, and sends my heart pounding. My immediate thought is that the Kazar is summoning me. If all went as I hoped, Sorin found a way to question his father's decision, without the Kazar tracing it back to me. If he so much as suspected I have anything to do with it, he would punish me for it and marry me off to Lord Dalgard anyway. My mouth is dry, no matter how often I swallow, and I can't keep from shaking as Hoa goes to the door. I hide my hands in the folds of my dress and struggle to keep my sc- struggle to keep my scrambled. Panicked thoughts from showing on my face. I'm acutely aware of Blaze and the others behind the walls. I can't let them see me afraid. I need to show them that I can be strong and sure. I cross to stand near Blaze's post, dropping my voice to to a whisper while Hoa is distracted listening to the guard. Remember what we talked about. The humiliation at the banquet was a mild inconvenience compared to what will happen now. The Kaiser's punishments are brutal, but not lethal. So you will let it happen and stay silent. Do not under. Do you understand? I don't let myself mention Lord Dalgard, as if not speaking about it will erase this threat. He doesn't reply, but I can almost feel an argument brewing. I'm too valuable to kill. I assure him, softening my voice. That's protection enough. He grunts in response, and I have no choice but to take that as assent. Hoa flits back into the room, light on her feet, her expression inscrutable. She immediately starts tugging at my dress and smoothing out the wrinkles that have come from sitting around all morning. Is it the Kaiser? I ask, letting real fear seep into my voice. Her eyes dart to mine briefly before dropping. She shakes her head. Relief spreads through me, loosening the python around my stomach. I have to force myself not to burst into inexplicable laughter. The prince, then, I ask, as she combs my hair back and fastens it in place with a pearl-encrusted pin. Another shake of her head. I frown, wondering who else would throw her into such a frenzy. Briefly, I consider the thine, which sends another shudder through me before I remember he's inspecting the mines. Still, I must be someone. It must be someone important, but no one apart from Crescentia, and now apparently Sodden pays me personal attention. Hoa drags her eyes over me one last time, from the top of my head to my sandaled feet. Before giving me a firm nod of approval and a non too gentle shove toward the door, where two guards wait. I know better than to ask the guards where we're going. Most Calvaxians, even those without titles, treat me as if I'm an animal instead of a girl. Though that isn't quite fair. I've seen plenty of Calvaxians speak to their dogs and horses with some measure of kindness. My Astrian gods are hazy in my mind, especially the dozens of minor gods and goddesses. But I'm fer- fairly sure there is no god of spy- spies along. Ah, sorry, but I'm fairly sure there is no god of spies among them. Delza, Suda's daughter, and the goddess of deception, is likely the closest. Though I'm not even sure she will be able to protect me from the whip. The sound of my shadows' footfalls are so common that I've almost stopped hearing them altogether. But now I'm all too aware of them. 
Despite his promise, I doubt that if it comes to a whipping or some other punishment, Blaze will be able to stay silent. The guards lead me down the halls, and I have to force my feet to keep moving forward. When I realize where we are going, my chest tightens until I can hardly breathe. I haven't been in the royal wing of the palace since before the siege, since it was my own home. The guards' boots click against the granite floor, and all I can think about is my mother chasing me down this hall, trying to wrangle me into a bath. The stained glass windows are cracked and dirty now, but I remember how the afternoon light used to filter through them and make the grey stone walls look like the inside of a jewelry box. Paintings used to line the halls, landscapes and portraits of my ancestors done in rich oil paints with gilded frames, but now they're all gone. I wonder what happened to them. Were they, were they sold or simply destroyed? Imagining those paintings in a heap with a torch put to them breaks my heart. This can't be the same hall I grew up in, where I lived with my mother. That hall lives in my memory, perfectly intact. But now that I see what's become of it, I wonder if I will ever be able to remember it the same way again. Still, as different as it is from the place I remember, it's haunted with the ghost of my mother, and her presence weighs down on my shoulders like the funeral shroud she was never given. I hear her laugh in the silence, the way it used to echo through the halls, so it was the last thing I heard each night before I fell asleep. We pass the door to the library, to the private royal dining room, to my former bedroom, and then the guards pull me to a halt in front of what was once known the door to my mother's sitting room. I don't know what it is now, but I'm sure it can only be the caser waiting for me on the other side with a whip in his hand. The guards push me through the door into a dimly lit room, and I immediately drop to a curtsy without looking up, heart thundering across my ribcage. Any hint of disrespect will cost me. Footsteps approach, lighter and slower than I'd been expecting. Red silk skirts and golden slippers fill my vision, while the cloying scent of roses tickles my nose, and I realize it isn't the Kaiser who summoned me, it's the Kaiserin. While she is moderately most more appealing option than the Kaiser, I'm not sure I'm grateful for it. At least, with the Kaiser, I know where I stand. I understand the rules of his games, even if he usually cheats. But I can't begin to guess what the Kaiserin wants from me, and I fear that looking at her will feel like looking at my future if I fail to gain my freedom. How long will it be before my own eyes grow so empty and distant? Hers have always been that way, I think, even when she first arrived in the palace after the siege. Then, in her mid-twenties, with smooth skin, loose yellow hair, and a seven-year-old sodden clutching her hand. She flinched when the Kaiser kissed her cheek in greeting, eyes darting around the room in a way I'd already grown too familiar with. She was searching for help she would never find. Leave us, she says now. Her voice is no louder than a whisper, but the guards comply, shutting the door behind them with a thunk that echoes in the mostly empty sitting room. I trust your back isn't broken enough to hinder your standing? she asks. I hasten to my feet, smoothing out my skirts as I do. The room is large but sparsely decorated. There are five enormous windows that line out of the walls. They're each draped with thick velvet curtains that keep out any trace of sunlight. Candles are lit instead, 
A taper stands four feet tall by the door, and a dozen thumb-sized ones crowd the low table in the center. The heavy brass chandelier overhead is lit as well, but the room still feels dark and gloomy. There is a hodgepodge of seating thrown around the table, including red velvet tufted chairs, sofas, and a chaise, all with gilt frames. Despite being filled with so much fire, the room is chilly. It's a different place entirely than it was when my mother when it was my mother's sitting room. I remember it bright and soft, with sunlight filtering through the stained glass windows and a thick patterned rug that covered most of the floor. Cozy chairs and sofas surrounded a sunstone fire pit where she would sit at the end of the day with her closest friends and advisers. The memories are hazy, but I remember her laughing with Ampelio, a goblet of red wine in her hand, while I played with my toys on the rug. I remember hearing them whispering something in her ear, and her resting her head on his shoulder. I don't know if the memory is real, but I suppose it doesn't matter. I can hardly ask them about it. I blink the thought away and force myself to focus on Kaiser Ank, Kaiser Rin Ank. It's been years since I've been this close to her in anything but an official capacity, when her skin has been slathered with an apothecary's worth of creams and tints. Time hasn't been kind to her, leaving her face looking like a half-melted candle and her hair thin and patchy. The red silk dress is finely crafted, but it sags on her gaunt frame and makes her skin look even more sallow. She's still young, not more than 35, but she looks much older, despite the water gems coiled around her neck. Your Highness summoned me? Her small milky eyes rake over me from the top of my head to my toes, and her mouth purses. I thought it best we speak privately before you go and do something foolish, she says. The roughness in her voice takes me by surprise. The rare times I've heard her speak in public, she's always sounded more like a child than a woman. I glance around the room. There is no one waiting behind her, no one crouched behind the patch of armchairs or the sofa. There is no one behind me either. The guards and my shadows remain on the other side of the thick door. At the volume she's speaking, no one else can hear her. Still, my stomach churns. I don't know what you're talking about, your highness. Her eyes linger on me a moment longer before her mouth curls into a tight smile and she clasps her hands in front of her. Each finger is ringed with a spirit gem, every gem except for earth. The Kaiser is sure to to forbid his wife any strength, though she could certainly use it. You're an accomplished liar, I'll admit that. But he's always better, isn't he? I fight the urge to swallow or look away. I hold her gaze. Who is? I ask. Her smile is wan. Very well, little lamb. We'll play your game. The nickname prickles the back of my neck like an annoying insect I can't ignore. She used to call me by it when she first came to the palace after the siege. That was before I understood the magnitude of everything that had happened. That was before the Kaiser's punishments started. That was when I'd mistaken her cowardice for kindness. I don't know what you mean, your highness, I tell her, keeping my voice level. She turns and walks away from me gliding toward the chaise with the grace of a ghost, 
before sinking down into it. Has anyone ever told you how I became a Kaiserin, little lamb? She asks. No, I lie. I've heard a dozen versions of the story, each one different. Even those who were there, who saw it happen with their own eyes, each has their own version of the tale, painting it as everything from a triumph to a tragedy. She leans back in the chaise and lifts her chin a fraction of an inch. Her eyes are far away, even when she looks directly at me. You might as well sit, she says. Tentatively, I cross the room and sit down in the chair closest to her. I try to mimic her prim body language, crossing my legs at the ankles and resting my hands in my lap. It's uncomfortable, but it's the way she always sits, even now when there is no one to see her but me. I was born Princessa of Rajinka, a small country on the eastern sea, a tenth child and a fourth daughter, of little importance outside the promise of a strong marriage. Luckily, one of our greatest allies had a son close to me in age. Our betrothal was sealed before my second birthday. The Kaiser, I asked. Her mouth twitches into something that might be a smile. Not at that time, no. Prince Corbinian was how I knew him. Everyone called him Corby, much to his great displeasure. I didn't meet him until I was twelve, but from that moment I was hopelessly smitten. She laughs softly and shakes her head. It's difficult to picture now, I suppose, but he was a gangly boy with an easy smile. He made me laugh. He wrote one another. We wrote one another such sentimental letters you could hardly believe it. I know that this story turns eventually to the Kaiser only speaking to her in cruelty and the Kaiserin going mad with fear and hate, thinking of him as a boy penning soppy love letters is impossible like trying to imagine a dog dancing a waltz. My wedding day was beautiful. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and I don't think I'd ever been happier. It was what I dreamt of for three years. It was everything I'd been raised for. You and I were raised in very different worlds. In that respect, she says, keeping her gaze on me until I glance away. She clears her throat and continues. We were wed in the chapel at my family's palace, where I had first sworn myself to my god as a child. We only had one in Ranjuka, you know. It was much less confusing. She pauses to take a breath, or maybe to steady herself. I know more or less what comes next. In no version is it ever a pleasant story, not for the Kaiserin, at least. We set our vows under the watch of his gods and mine, and the whole time he couldn't take his eyes off me. It felt like, it felt like we were the only two people in the chapelle, like we were the only two people in the world. And when it was official, he raised his hand and gave a signal I didn't understand. Though I know what happens, I still wait to hear her say it, barely breathing. His father's men turned their blades on their Kaiser, their Kaiserin, all of his siblings to be safe, even the little ones, barely out of their short clothes. A few of the noblemen as well, anyone whose loyalty Corbinian couldn't secure. And when that was done and the floors of the chapelle were slick with Calovaxian blood, 
They turned on my family and friends. Bringing weapons into a, a place of worship is a sin, so my people couldn't even defend themselves. It was a slaughter. Her voice begins to shake, and I can't help wondering if this is the first time that she's told the story. Who else would have listened? The Kaiserin keeps no confidants, has no friends, no one at all who is wholly hers, and like me, there are parts of her she has to hide at all costs from the Kaiser. My parents, my brothers, my sisters, the girls I'd had lessons with, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, all of them were dead before I even had time to scream. And when it was done, do you know what my love said to me? No. My voice comes out hoarse. I've given you two countries to rule, my love. Now what will you give me? The words send a shiver down my spine. Why are you telling me this? I ask. She closes her eyes and takes a moment to calm herself. Her shaking slows, and when she opens her eyes again, the cloudiness is gone, replaced by a fire I didn't think her capable of. Because I know the spark of rebellion when I see it. There was a time when I knew that spark very well, but I need you to understand that you are playing a dangerous game with a dangerous man, and there are consequences when you lose, and you will lose. I know that as well. I glance around the room, expecting to see holes in the walls, expecting to hear guards burst in the room ready to arrest us both for speaking against the Kaiser. She sees this and smiles. No, little lamb, I rid myself of my shadows years ago. All it took was a decade of docility and submission for Corby Corbinian to call, call them off, or, I suppose, to give them to you. With enough time, you will lose them as well. Once Corbinian stops seeing you as threat, or you have someone he can use against you the way he uses Sodden against me. I'm still not quite sure what you want from me, I tell her, but I know I don't sound convincing. She lifts a shoulder in a shrug. My son came to me last night. He had some concerns about Corbinian's plans to marry you off, and hoped that I could change his mind. He was smart to come to me instead of going straight to his father. Of course, you were smarter still to seek out his help in the first place. I force my expression into one of innocence, though I'm starting to think it's useless with her. The prince and I have become friends, your highness. I was troubled, understandably, when I heard the Kaiser intended to marry me off to Lord Dalgard, and I turned to Soren as a friend. For a long moment she's quiet. I have taken the liberty of arranging an alternative marriage for Lord, Lord Dalgard, she says finally. One he found perfectly amenable. I am very grateful, your highness, I breathe. It might be the first true thing I've said to her. Her thin eyebrows arch. Aren't you curious to know whose well-being was traded for your own? I try to look chastened, but I can't quite manage it. The truth, damned as it make me, is that I don't care at all which spoiled and vicious Calovaxian girl the Kaiserin had tried to trade for me. I'd watch them all die without batting an eyelash. Even Crescentia? A small voice asks in the back of my mind, but I ignore it. Cress is too valuable to marry off to someone like Lord Dalgard. It would never happen. I could imagine, your highness, that the wisest choice would have been Lady Dagmer, I say. Such a match would please anyone. 
Dagmar's father likely put up a fuss about Lord Dalgard's history, but since it was you asking, and I assume adding a little extra to Lord Dalgard's bid, he gave in easily enough. She purses her lips. You have a sharp mind, little lamb, and all sharper still for keeping it hidden. But make no mistake, there will be another match made for you, likely a crueler one. I don't see who could be crueler than Lord Dalgard, I say it, holding her gaze with mine. Don't you, she asks, tilting her head to one side. My husband would hardly be the first Kaiser to rid himself of his wife to take a younger bride. I have nothing left for him, after all, she says casually. But you're young. You could give him more children and strengthen his hold on the country. And I've seen him look at you. I'd imagine the whole court has, my, chival my chivalrous fool of a son included. Corbinian isn't exactly subtle, is he? I try to speak, but words fail me. The python is back, wrapping itself around my stomach and chest so tightly I'm sure it will kill me. I want to deny her words, but I can't. She gets to her feet and I know that I should rise as well and curtsy, but I'm frozen in place. Some advice, little lamb? Next time you close a window, make sure it doesn't open a trapdoor beneath your feet. She's halfway to the door when I find my voice. I don't know what I'm doing, I admit, barely louder than a whisper. The Kaiserin hears me, though. She turns and regards me with that disconcerting, unfocused stare of hers. You're a lamb in the lion's den, child. You're surviving. Isn't that enough? <laughs>